Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This Parsha is the first time that I've turned and I said, wow, it really is the end of the year. It was my first moment of really feeling like the calendar wasn't wrong. This verse is going to be familiar to you. It's two verses exactly. From Torah portion, Nitzavim. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your children may live. To love Adonai your God, to hearken to God's voice, to cleave to God. For that is your life and the length of your days. That you may dwell in the land which Adonai swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, all right, everybody gets 100% on that exam. That you may live, you and your children, to love Adonai your God, to hearken to God's voice, to cleave to God, for that is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which Adonai swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. As multiple choice exams go, it's kind of an easy one. Life and death, blessing and curse. Let me see now. Which one do I want? It seems like it would be pretty, pretty obvious. So what does it really mean in that context to choose life? Rabbi Ishmael, in the Jerusalem Talmud, deduced from the words choose life that you should make a living. You should choose a livelihood that you and your children may live and that by being of gainful employment, you'll be in a position where you'll have enough food in your belly and then you can devote yourself to loving God and listening to God's voice and cleaving to God and you'll be able to live in the land and not be homeless or not die of starvation. And that was his interpretation. And it's an interesting interpretation because we normally think choose life means anything but choose work. You know, anything but that. Years ago, I was a scholar residence in Detroit for six weeks. And I met up with this amazing man somewhere in some file or another. I still have his newsletters. He was an independent businessman. He manufactures extremely large machine parts, like things for rocket ships and things that build other things. And, you know, he, he had business sometimes with the car companies and with the airplane manufacturers and the biggest cranes in the world. He made their parts and their bolts. And, you know, it sounds like a really, really exciting, sexy business, you know, bolt making. And uh, he was always, always happy about his business. And I talked at one time about the spirituality of work and he came to that lecture, he sat in the front row. He was the only person who came in just beaming. Everybody else schlepped themselves in. Maybe I can learn something about my lousy job. You know, that was a that was a tenor. He came in. I love work, you know, and he came and sat in the front row and he shared with me this newsletter that it puts the rabbinical assembly newsletter to shame because the rabbinical assembly newsletter is full of business. And the giant bolt newsletter, whatever it was called, was full of spirituality. And uh, there's this beautiful newsletter that the lead article in one edition was all about tirade against the idea that nobody should ever say on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. And he said, you know, when given that we spend, on average, most of us, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week for the better part of our adult lives at work, why shouldn't it be a place that you consider worthy of returning to? Let's cultivate that. Let's make work something wonderful. And from this point of view, it really is a matter of choosing life. When you think about how you relate to your work in life, whether that work is going to school or whether that work is retirement or whether that work is a profession or business of your own, working in somebody else's business, that notion that where you're giving your work and your livelihood should be a source of inspiration really does make you kind of sit up a little taller, sit up a little straighter and say, yeah, that's choosing life. To say, I, I write off eight hours a day for sleep and another eight hours for work and maybe in the last third of life I can find a little joy is not really choosing life. And I think he makes an excellent point, Rabbi Ishmael. On the other
other hand, I remember very well this very strong moment that I had once on the Bema. I was sharing the pulpit with Rabbi Mordechai Finley in Los Angeles at Macomb or Shalom. And people would ask us questions from time to time. And somebody asked him a question that had a little caveat to it. In which they said, well, maybe this really isn't your area because, you know, you don't really know about the real world. And he took great umbrage at that. And you know, he's a former Marine. When he gets mad, you get scared. He just got very tall. His chest kind of puffed out. He looked even more barrel-chested than usual. He was really angry about it. And he said, I need to tell you something about what real life is. Are you telling me I don't know about livelihood and business? I don't know how to choose the right stock in the stock market. I'm not good with accounting or budgets. Is that what you're trying to tell me? I accept that. You're telling me I don't know about real life? I'm the guy who knows about real life. I sit with people on the eve of their weddings. I talk to people about conversion. I sit with people at their bedsides when they're on their deathbed. I come visit people at the hospital when it's a life and death surgery. I know real life. You're telling me there's something out there about business? Fine. But what I do is real life. And you better get that straight. So I quote these two stories because I really think that Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Finley have their points. That life is about commerce in some very real way. It shapes who we are. And also life is not about commerce, ultimately. I'm going to give you a similar dichotomy. The Clea Carr, who was known for his uh, fire and brimstone sermons, not unlike Rabbi Mordecai Finley, said, this is how you have to understand choose life. Most people say a mozi in order to eat. But the truly righteous eat in order to say a mozi. So, if you look at life in that way, we're not asking God that we do good in the world, that we cleave to God in order that we should live. We're asking for life in order that we have the ability to do good and to cleave to God. That's what it means to choose life. To choose life for the utmost reason, for the highest reason, for the rarest reason. And that's really choosing life. But looking at those saintly people as a paradigm can be intimidating. And I remember one time when I was in college having this conversation about what's real life. Uh, One of those, you know, late night bull sessions that this sort of question disposes itself to. And I was talking with a group of friends, and I lived at that time in the French house, and we were speaking in French, and they said to me, oh, you're not really very acquainted with life, because after all, you know, you're Jewish, and that's such a small percentage of the population, and that really doesn't relate to most people, and after all, look at where we are, we're in this privileged university, and most of the world doesn't get the kind of opportunities we get. We're we're very divorced from life. We know nothing of life. So I thought about that, and I think there's some truth in that, but then I said, wait a minute. You know, so is it all just a numbers game? Whatever's the most popular is the most real and the most living? Does that mean that, you know, if most of the world lives on two dollars a day, that's real life and what we're living is somehow fake? And if we're really going by the numbers, most of the earth is water. So real life is a fish? Well, that particular statement, real life is a fish, became like the, unintentionally kind of the motto of the French house for that. For that. And the symbol was poisson, you know, everywhere where they would put it all, up, all over the place, fish in French. And it also occurred to me that it was kind of interesting that this group of native English speakers, mostly, who were speaking in French, thought that Judaism was obscure. So what are we talking about here? So... The question is, is life about what's ubiquitous or is life about what's rare? And you can make a good argument for both. So we, we have life is about commerce and not about commerce, and life is about what's rare and not about what's rare. I also want to 
want to suggest that there's a third dichotomy. Rashi says that this really isn't a choice at all. It's a commandment. This is what we will do. This is what we must do. There's no viable alternative. You have to choose life. But others point out we choose death all the time. We make choices that reduce our vitality. We cut short our lifespan through bad health choices. We elect deadening but safe tasks or relationships over choices that are alive with possibility, including, of course, the possibility of failure. And every night across America, millions of people choose to stay home and watch TV with a bag of potato chips for company over attending a class or going out with friends or volunteering to help a person or a cause. So it's not unheard of to choose death. It's not unheard of at all. So these are my three teachings. Life is about commerce and it's not about commerce. Life is shaped by what's ubiquitous unless it's shaped by what's rare. And we have no choice, but it's up to us. And all three statements are truths held in tension because, of course, life is complicated. That's one thing we can say when contemplating what it means to choose life. I want to point out that This whole notion of choosing life is very much embedded throughout High Holidays when we talk about being entered in the Book of Life, but also using our own handwriting to write in that very book. The Natana Toka's prayer talks about all the things that are not within our choice. Who shall live and who shall die? Who in length of days and who too quickly? Who by fire and who by earthquake? And then it also talks about the things that we do choose in life. For example, tshuva, tefillah, rutzdaka, repentance, prayer, and righteous giving, which will always incline you toward life. To conclude, I want to sing with you, You shall choose life that you and your children may live. Uvacharta bachayim leman tichia atavizaracha. Vahata Bahaim Leman Tihye Atavizaracha. I like this melody because it sounds more like an invitation than a commandment. Two five. Vahata Bahaim. Leman tichye ata v'zarecha Le'avat Adonai u'ledav kabo Le'avat Adonai u'ledav kabo U'vacharta Bahaim Leman Tichye Atav Zarecha